Kim. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Nick. I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> Me too. Before we started the interview, we're already laughing and it's a good thing. Laughter is the it best is. medicine for me. <laughs> yes, you bet. Yes. Good morning to you. Thank you. <laughs> First off, I would like to say thank you very much for saying yes to the interview today. And I know this was a postponed interview, but thanks to technology, we're here now. And we're going to be talking about a lot of things, especially the part where you grew up in South Korea before. So Asian here, yeah. <laughs> I can relate because in high school, I grew up with K-pop as well. So <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So yes, to the listeners, my name is Nicolette. I am the creator for the podcast titled You're Worthless. Read that again, the juxtaposition of your very soul. So we have Andrea Johnson here with us today. And I would like to read a bit of her introduction to all of you listening. And then we can get right into asking her some questions. So hey, everyone, we have Andrea Johnson here with us. So Andrea works with leaders who feel stifled and have grown unsatisfied with their current level of influence. She facilitates improve communication in a corporate culture by working within teams. Her passion is equipping female leaders to define a new culture by trusting their own ability to think critically, create imaginatively, and lead effectively. Andrea was raised on the mission field of Seoul, South Korea, and as a third culture kid. She is familiar with navigating cultural di diversity to find her own place of belonging. A family history of obesity showed up early, along with bulimia and depression. Her determination to become healthy, however, led to gastric bypass surgery and is a testament to her persevering spirit. She experienced early menopause at 39 and became an adoptive mother to private adoption at 42. Her personal journey of deconstructing her own assumptions, beliefs, and conditioning produced her signature tool, Intentional Optimism. It provides the framework for how we do what we do. It's the attitudes and mindset we employ in embody to live out our own values, goals, and dreams with excellence. Andrea is a certified Maxwell leadership trainer, coach, and DISC DISC behavioral analysis consultant. Welcome, Andrea. Wow. I was like, you have the long bio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All the dirty people. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, I would love our listeners to um to have a sneak peek about who our listener today who are, who's our guest today so can you share with us andrea what was it like growing up as yourself um there was a lot of conflict not in my family but inside me there was a lot and because i was a very strong-willed kid i as you know you said i'm a disc consultant that's a behavioral analysis communication it kind of tells us how we're wired and when i take the assessment it comes out as the leader and so I was, you know, a, a woman in a very patriarchal Asian society, in a patriarchal um, evangelical Christian society. And none of this was meant bad. It just was, you know, strong women are not really, <laughs> really like lifted up there. And so I, there was a lot of conflict for me. I didn't quite know how to be myself. I didn't know how to embrace who I was. And so while I look back on it and I think, gosh, I could never, ever trade the education of growing up in another culture. Right. There are things I wish I had known better and wish I had done better. You know, my parents did what they could um, with what they had because they only had what they had and what they were raised with. But um, for me, it was a lot of conflict. And that's what came out in my eating in bulimia and depression. Um, so in in that way, it was kind of hard. But in other ways, it was charmed. I mean, like charmed. We were Americans in a society that liked Americans and saw Americans as liberators. And by the time I was graduating from high school, though, they were about ready to kick us out. Um, and um, <laughs> I totally get it. Um, and so a lot of stuff has changed since I was there. But, um, but it also was a, it was really nice being in that Eastern culture that reveres wise people and reveres older generations and mm -hmm. understands how generations work and thinks in story rather than in than in bullet points and, and progress. Eastern mindset is just very different from a Western mindset. And I've learned a lot about that now as I'm older that I didn't quite understand then. It just seemed like part of the fabric. Yeah. <laughs> and 
you know, we, um, we had lovely friends and the Korean people are just gracious as can be and so hospitable. Um, yet we had people who had been there for 50, 100 years, you know, long before the the Korean War, long before World War One, long before the Japanese occupation. So like their family lines had been there. And so we actually had a huge community of expatriates that we were able to hang out with. And so I went to an international school. I didn't go to Korean school, but made things different. Um, so I had like the best of American life. And we even had a beach cabin the- down uh, in Bhutan. And we go there all summer. I was a lifeguard. So it was a little bit like having the rich lifestyle in the United States. And we were poor. We were dirt <laughs> poor. And we didn't know we were poor, you know? Because um, when you travel overseas back and forth. Automatically, and, you think that, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because we had no idea. I, I didn't know we were poor. I grew up wearing um, Nikes because they were made there. I grew up wearing, and we got them cheap, wearing silk dresses because, you know, in Asia, silk is cheaper than cotton. And, you know, coming back to Texas or coming back to Virginia made it, it was a real rude awakening. So I look back now and I see this real duality of the conflict inside myself and the charmed life that I seem to have been living. Love that. Wow, there's so many things to unpack. So what, what happened that actually led you to that bulimic, um, period and depression like what actually happened well you know i think i don't know that there's one thing i could say um as far as like a like there was not a single traumatic experience Mm -hmm. um but the more i learn about myself and i look back i can see why i didn't handle things well Mm -hmm. i am an Enneagram six and I like safety and um, I'm a thinker. And so everything happens in here. And it's a lot of things that, and it's like anxiety, you know, Um, but looking back, moving around a good bit and then moving completely overseas, I think was in itself a traumatic experience. I didn't Mm. know whether or not I would be safe. We lived there in a time when in the mid to like we went in 74 and I graduated from high school in 84 and came home. So I'm, I'm 57. Oh, that's 10. Um, ten. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being transparent. <laughs> so that's 10 years in Korea. Wow. Yeah. So, um, but I went there and I started third grade, but it was a time of quite a bit of upheaval. North Koreans were consistently digging tunnels underneath the DMZ and submarines were coming around on the coast to try and come to infiltrate it was, if you look back at the history, um, I remember when the president, there was an assassination attempt on the president, but it was his wife that was killed. Mm-hmm. I remember when the North Koreans came across the DMZ into the demilitarized zone and killed American soldiers in the DMZ. I, I remember waking up in the middle of the night because we had a curfew from midnight to 4 a.m. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and hearing tanks rolling down the streets just because that's wow. what they did, you know? And wow. so um, I, I woke up one morning and my dad, my parents weren't there and we were in a little duplex. And so my missionary, we called them aunts and uncles. It was like a an extended family because we had left yeah. all our family at home. So my aunt Barbara came across like through the basement and found me. And cause I was hollering, I'm like, mom, dad, where's everybody? <laughs> and in the middle of the night, my dad had a kidney stone. And so they literally turned off the lights on the car and drove my dad through and around the barbed wire, trying to get him to the hospital through the curfew. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like those kinds of things, we don't realize how they affect us. And then you look back on them and people say, wait a minute, you went to the beach and the soldiers were practicing target practice on the rocks. <laughs> and you could, he- you know, we could hear the the planes going over and the, 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 F, the American planes would fly so low. We could like read, you know, we'd had to like do this and, and, ride with them, you know? and just because they were practicing and because there was so much activity, we just didn't realize, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. how that affects us. And so I think all of those things combined with my own personality um, made it so that food was a very acceptable, safe thing for me to kind of wrap myself in. It was right. a comfort and to, because it was, this is long before Korea became this amazing technology powerhouse. Yes. And, yes. You know, I mean, it was, this is long before, this is 50 years ago, right? And yeah. Um, they didn't have canned goods. So everything was fresh. We had to can all our own food. We had to do all of these things. And so it was very much going from the United States where everything was a lot more modern to, if we felt like third world, it really mm-hmm. wasn't. It was still Seoul. Yeah. I mean, it was still a big city. Exactly. But, um, but 
we would take a lot of food with us, canned goods. I would sneak foods like peanut butter and keep it under my bed or um, stuff out of the freezer if we had ice cream and just little things that would allow me to kind of soothe my anxiety because I just didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to soothe that. Regulate. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. I had no idea how to regulate my emotions and um, my parents had no idea, you know, they were just trying to make ends meet. They were trying exactly. to make sure we stayed warm in the winter and cool in the summer. We didn't have air conditioning and it was just, you know, we were from Texas. So it's like, you have air conditioning. Of course you have air conditioning. <laughs> so, me too. You know, it's blasting so, now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's those kinds of things that we just, I don't think we realize sometimes what we've been through because it just seemed like normal life, you know? And um, so I, I still look back and say it was a very charmed life, but I have to recognize there were some things that I think not pushed me, but kind of enabled me or made it so that I needed to find something like to help. And I was a good girl, so I wasn't going to drink and I wasn't going to do drugs. And that was all available because nothing is it, – still, it's like you just walk into a drugstore today. You don't need a prescription. You know, there was no drinking age. And my friends did that kind of thing. But I just I, I just was afraid to do it. And so um, I, I ate instead. You ate. Well, thank you. Wow. Mm. No, I think I'm going to go <laughs> back to – it's going to go back and forth on this. But let's go back to the work that you do currently. What are core values? I wish I had known this, Nick, when I was 15, because core values are basically the principles and the priorities that we are born with that kind of help us navigate through all of life's twists and turns, ups and downs, waves the crashing over us of emotion or circumstance while keeping our own authority and our own authenticity at the forefront, right? It's like, those are the principles that are our non-negotiables. Most of us do not honor those because it is not in our best interest society-wise to honor our own core values. And it just is easier and better for us to blend in or to capitulate, if you will, or to say, I'm, I'm going to like follow this line instead of, you know, following my own. For instance, another way you can describe them is they're... A lot of people now talk about values in business and they talk about the core values of a business or an organization, but those are outside of you. Those are more what I would call the principles and the mission and the vision of a business. Mm -hmm. Core values are inside of you. They're not mm -hmm. your family. This is my definition, right? This is the way I work. It's not your family. It's not your faith. It could be, faith could be a core value, but it's not um, in your country. And, um, it's really more things that are kind of, you can't see them but they're very real. And if you dishonor one, you will know it, right? Yeah. So for instance, it's if, like disrespecting yourself or disrespect, I don't know, like karma exactly. is just going to hit you. <laughs> like, well, and yeah. here's, here's the deal. We're going to react to it. Mm. We're going to react no matter, because it's who, it's how we're wired. It's like, yeah. it's the basic internal principles. It's like your own compass mm. and it, there's no bad, right? It's like people don't, People don't do this work because it's scary to look inside, right? But the reality is nobody has a core value of narcissism. Nobody has a core value of unkindness. They have a core value of kindness. So a couple of other principles that I like to share about core values is number one, they are internal, but you can tell when you've, you've hit one because every decision we've ever made has been affected by a core value. Every time we've been angry, Every time we have been joyous, every time we've accomplished something, every time we've been uncomfortable, somehow a core value is being touched. That's how important yes. it is. Yes. And That's we right. don't realize it. And if we just get angry and we like talk about the topic rather than the actual core value, then it's a problem. And so that's one principle. The other principle is that they're reciprocal. It's, I don't just want freedom for me. I want freedom for you. I don't just want respect for me. I want respect for you, right? It's like, I, I receive it and I give it. Like, I want it to be both ways. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times people will say, well, I just need respect. It's like, well, that's fine, but you need to give it as well or else it's not a core value. Exactly. It might be something that you want and we have principles that we live by. Um, but beyond that, um, it's, these are the things that give you the most joy and bring you the most pain if they're like dishonored. 
Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the basics of core values. Um, I love walking with people through theirs. I love kind of helping them figure it out and watching the light bulbs go on. It takes a while to figure them out. It's not an overnight. You can't just like go, oh, my core values are this. Mm-hmm. Very few people can say that. Mm-hmm. 100% of my clients that start out with me think they know their core values. And 100% of them were wrong. Not even 1% is correct. <laughs> no, so far, you know, it may be that they might have one that's a really, they, they have a good idea that it's, that it's real. But most of the time they don't because it's usually a surface level thing or it's outside them. And as we dig deeper, we figure it out. For instance, for me, I started this work in 1995. These are my governing values from, have you heard of uh, Steve Covey, you know, the Franklin Covey system? He's like, oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So yeah. back in 1995, I had my Franklin planner system with like the six, the big binder with the six, the six rings. And yeah. um, part of doing a book for that, because this is when I was in grad school when I met my husband, um, was figuring out my governing values. And I still mm. have them. It's laminated with packing tape because I wanted to make sure I never lost it. And the top one is freedom. What I've learned over the years is that it felt like I didn't want anybody to control me. That's what mm. I thought. I, that's what I thought it was. Oh, but okay. the more I, yeah, but it's the more not. I about myself, Nick, it's like an autonomy of thought. It's a freedom of thought. I can be an employee. I can be a good employee. I can be, I can follow all the rules. Most of the time I drive within the speed limit. I can do those kinds of things, but I don't love them. As long as you don't tell me how to think. When you start telling me, this is what you need to believe. This is how you need to think. You have to fall in line inside my head. No, but then we're going to have a real problem. And a really simple example of that is my husband used to say things like, wouldn't you agree? And then he would finish a sentence. And my mother would do that. She'd say, don't you think this is really pretty? And Mm -hmm. I'm like, you're putting me in an impossible position. What if I don't like it? You know, what if I don't agree that this is, that's pretty. Yes. yes. And so then it's like, how do I, how can I, because my second is authenticity. So how can I be honest and be Mm -hmm. authentic Mm -hmm. and think for myself? I can't do that. Right. So whether or not I think this is pretty is irrelevant to the conversation. And I, it wasn't until I figured out and went deeper and looked at myself and said, oh, it's, it's this freedom of thought. It's autonomy of thought. Mm-hmm. Then I realized, I told my husband, I said, I think we need to try this differently. And so Ooh, we came up with- You had that conversation, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> How did it go? How did it go? <laughs> and let me tell you, this yes. month is okay. our 29th anniversary. <gasps> wow. Yeah. So we've been- Congratulations. Doing, yeah. So, that's all that's three decades almost. No, so it's important for us to make sure that we communicate well and we love each other. And we and this is the thing is when you start telling people who love you what your core values are, they want to celebrate that with you. It's like if they don't love you, then they're gonna be like, eh, whatever, or mm-hmm. no, I don't want to do that. But if they love you, then they want to meet you where you are. They they want you to be happy, right? Mm-hmm. And so I thought, we gotta do this different. So what we came up with is now he says, What do you think about this? I love that. Right. What do you think about this? Yeah. So you can, have, that's a leeway for you to say yes, no. Like, and and yeah. then it gives me the freedom to say, you know, I don't think I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Or, oh, I am totally on board. Or <laughs> let's talk that out. And half the time, you know, we'll talk it out. I may not have thought about it before. And I think out loud with him. And mm-hmm. then it's done. And some of that is personality, but some of that is just my core value. Yeah. And so, you know, people a lot of times, Nick will tell me that, oh, my core value, my top core value is family. No, it's not. I, it's a thing I value. It's a principle I value. It is there. My core values get played out in my family. For instance, my top one is autonomy of thought, right? So my family understands that mom is going to think about it. It's just me and my husband and my son. <clears throat> mm. But they understand that mama's got her own mind and that's mm. okay. And that's acceptable in this little group, right? Mm-hmm. My sister is there. My dad is not quite there. <laughs> my sister gets it. You know? um, but it plays out in my family there. My second one is authenticity. And yes. we've talked already about me just being myself. I have opinions. I'm still not comfortable sharing them, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I was told when I was young, not everybody wants to hear your opinion. Well, now people pay me to hear my opinion, you know? Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> evidently, people do want to hear my opinion. It's just you didn't want to hear my opinion or it was being told at an inopportune time. Or maybe mm-hmm. I was just being too, like, we do need to learn how to regulate certain things, right? Mm-hmm. But so that second one is authenticity. So I want to be myself and I want to let other people be themselves. Yes. And so therefore my son who's adopted, we're just kind of watching him and enjoying this blossoming of this person because he's not genetically connected. So we have no idea 
what he's going to turn out like, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's just, we get to watch that. I get to play that out in my family. Like, this is who he is. You can't ask him to be somebody different. My husband and I love American football. We love American baseball. Hate. (laughs) And it's like, I mean, we can't go tailgating. We can't go to parties. We can't go to baseball games. He's like, this is boring. And she like that. We love video games and Lego uh, building oh, things. Hands on. on. Yeah, right. And so we tried putting him in sports and it just didn't work because he also has ADHD. So we thought, well, this would be good for him, you know, to be in a sport to like get some of the energy out. No, he just, he would much rather like figure something out and, and make build, like he has all the Lego speed car, you know, things like the McLarens and the Lamborghinis and stuff. And he'll take them apart and build his own supercar yeah. with them, you know? And yeah. um, so I want to make sure that he feels that he can be authentic as well. But my third is belonging. Mm. And that word is in my bio. It's like, I had to learn to find belonging because I kept looking for it outside myself. And then I had to realize it's here. It's here. And it's, so I'm a Christian. So it's in my relationship to God. It is in my relationship with my family. I belong here in my family. My extended family has made it very clear as weird as you are or different as you are from us, you still belong, Except you, yeah. you know, and my friends will tell me that I belong, but I want to make sure that every conversation I have, you feel like you belong here, no matter what, right? I don't want to ever do anything that would make anybody that I'm talking to feel like they didn't have a place. They're less than, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that's how, like in my family, that's how my core values show up. That's how my core values show up in the way I talk to people. And I have clients who, like one of them, she's like, I think my top core value, and she went through round and round on this. She said, it's dependability. And I'm like, seriously? And what's dependability? What's that? <laughs> like, and so here's the other thing is we get to define them ourselves, right? Because yeah. when you walk through the process, it's a little bit of a brain dump. You, you like, mm. put all this stuff down and then you narrow it down and then you kind of figure out what your definition would be. And my definition of freedom is different from yours because mm. of the things that I want to be free from, which is like, don't tell me how to think. But her definition of dependability had to do with, I am going to do what I say, and I need you to do what you say, right? It's like, if I say I'm going to do something, Uh, I'm going to do it, right? It's like, I can depend on you. If you say you're going to do something, then I can Mm. follow through. So it's like, then you get to put your own definition. What does that mean there? And then you learn how to communicate it. But it's, everybody's wired a little differently. And it's just so fun to watch people figure out, my goodness, this is why I have always had a problem with this relationship. This is why I really didn't like working in that job. I, I mean, <laughs> could you laugh? You touch. <laughs> I touch nerve. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's it's it, well, yeah. It's one thing that I'm dealing now. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That so communication it's, part is the. Uh... Yeah. So in mm. my business, I work with people. A lot of times, we'll start with DISC, which is an assessment that you take for ten minutes or fifteen minutes. It's very simple. It gives you a thirty-page report. It explains how you're wired to communicate. Right. So we all have patterns of communication, and it's, it's four different quadrants. It's very simple. It's very tactile. It's very black and white. You know, it's like you're either. A, so it stands for. D is dominant or director or, or driven. And they're only about 3% of the population. These are your doers. <laughs> it's like the bottom line people. Right. I is influencer or um, inspirational. These are your storytellers. They're about 11% of the population. That's me. The S's, D-I-S, it goes around a quadrant, is are your studies. These are the ones who are your team players. Gonna... Pardon? The researcher. Because well, that's your that's your C. That's your compliant or your creative. Right. So your studies are your team players and the ones who are going to make the trains run on time. They're going to make you follow all the rules. They're going to get everybody together. They're about 69% of the population. And then your C's are the creatives and the compliance who are your detail people. Beethoven was probably, you know, he went deaf and then he still composed music. He was a C. He could, he knew music well enough and he knew what it was going to sound like. He could actually do it while he was deaf. So these are your people who are your detail. <laughs> And we're all a little bit of all of that. Everything, but, yeah. Yeah, a little bit of everything. We fall, we have a little bit of all of it in us. But when we, when I can show somebody that and then say, all right, let's see how your core values show up and how you communicate. And then taking their disc information to their boss or to their team and then taking their core values and saying, these are the things that are important to me. And so as we work together, how can we 
you know, what are yours? How can we do this together? I've had team leaders actually take the exercise to their team and figure out their team core values based on everybody's personal core values and saying, well, what does our team want to stand for? You know, not even in an organization, just a team in an organization. And it's just fascinating work to see people really like decide this is who I am and I'm going to move forward this way. And I'm going to figure out the best way to work in this situation or in my family, you know, that kind of thing. It's just really rewarding work. Mm. So how do they summarize from the individual DISC result to having come up with the overall DISC result for the team? This is just me thinking out loud. So do you mean core values or DISC? Sorry, uh, DISC. Okay. So with DISC, um, I actually have the ability to run a report that shows, like if the whole team takes the DISC assessment Uh, individually. Then then it calculates which one's the highest. It's all very scientific, right? Whereas core values is a lot more, it's like, this is where we have to talk. This is where Mm. we have to Um, Because people are going to answer things based on what they think they're supposed to say uh, and the disc yeah. assessment actually kind of takes that into consideration right so there's mm. you end up with three graphs it's like the graph of who you're showing up to be today like who do you think you're supposed to be what you're born with this is probably what you are when you're really stressed and you know you get squeezed and this is the true you that comes out and then you have the ones that you've worked on the most. So we call them like muscle groups. It's like the muscles mm. you're born with, the muscles you use today, and then the muscles you've worked on the most. I do, I walk and I do like strength training and it's like my muscles today, my back muscles are sore because I did a bunch yesterday. And so it's like, you know, being able to say, all right, well, I've worked on, like I've worked really hard on being a follow through person because I am not, <laughs> I am not that person. <laughs> So, you know, I've worked hard on those. And so in that last graph, it shows that I, but I pretty much have embraced the fact that I need people around me on my team and to help me that are good at follow through. It's Um, it's a sounding board. Yes. (laughs) Same. Accountability. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because humans, we are wired for, we are wired to be in a tribe. I mean, it's innate. So really, you, do you think, do you disagree? (laughs) That a certain percentage of the population is okay with being by themselves or. Well, okay, let me put it, let me not say by themselves because I don't Mm -hmm. want to be by myself, but some of us are wired in such a way that is, that we don't go along with the tribe. Right. So yeah, some of us yeah, are more yes, like team yes, yes. and leaders. I mean, literally my disc type is the leader. And I know I have I have zero. It's like my F is so low. It's like the <laughs> the steady, the like team player. It's like so I just joke with people. I'm like, I'm a definition of a non team player. And um <laughs> and you know, that's hard when you're in a society that values that. That's hard when you're in a society that doesn't value women in leadership positions, that even though they say they do, even though they want to promote women, it's still a dog eat dog world. It's like a cat fight every day. And it's just, so I was like, I don't need that anymore. And I'm going to go do my own thing. Um, but I do think, cause I also have looked and I am not a, I, I'm not skilled in this. I have a coach who does human design. And so one of the things I learned about my human design is that I do not have tribal community uh, i am not so you're the and example like, it confirmed at all <laughs> i'm like well there's my disc and there's my core values don't tell me how to think right just and i worked for almost 25 years in higher education for some amazing universities schools of medicine and managed people into operations and administration and it's a, i mean these schools have amazing work and they have really good things that they stand for but i'm an out-of-the-box thinker I'm a person who's like, how can we do this different? And they're like, how can we keep the status quo? Yeah. How can we not rock the boat? How can we not rock the boat? Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, we can be angry at that or we can recognize that it's a really big institution and therefore they, they are going to change much more slowly, you know? And so I had to realize that my personality and my core values helped me see I'm going to do better as a consultant, as a teacher, as a trainer, as a coach, but it took me a long time. I didn't, I didn't leave my job until two and a half years ago. So yeah. So, cause there's just all of that stuff that we have to deal with, whether or not, you know, we're worthy of even doing that on our own, whether or not I can actually support myself. And, um, you know, that's this, this kind of work is like this. It's not, it's not a steady income. 
or There's no 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 if it's a nine to five it's like that in Korean it's like that okay then uh, and then in Korean then that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's like you get a contract and you're up here. And then and then you're like, oh, yeah. Blah, blah. And then it's like another contract, and then you have a little bit coming in here and there. And, you know, so um, fortunately, this is where my husband and my son live. Let me be authentic. It's like, wow. I know financially we're not where we want to be because of my choices, but I am so much happier and I am grateful for the opportunity to be myself to get to even have conversations like this. What a blessing, right? Because how many people don't, don't not just have, it's not that they don't just have the opportunity. It's they don't have the courage. They don't have, they haven't, haven't reached a place where they've given themselves permission, you know? So, um, I don't ever want to, I have a journal that I keep. It's, um, the Hebrew word for blessings is chesed and it's just like God's favor. It's like this lovely blessing. So it's nothing that I've earned. It's just this. So I keep a journal and say, this was a good blessing today, you know? And, um, and it helps me remember that I am safe, that I don't need to rely on food for my comfort, that it is okay for me to be who I am. It is okay for me to love my family the way I love my family, to show up for my clients or for interviews as me. And um, so that's, yeah. I love that. I love that. Oh my God, you're glowing. <laughs> <laughs> When I saw your LinkedIn profile, yeah, you're just like, wow, she looks stunning. Oh, thank you. Yes. And, and I can resonate with the transitioning from nine to five because i'm doing that right now as we speak <laughs> be encouraged yeah oh uh, so there's this term that the the instructor says to me marissa pierre she says change all the nervousness or the scary to excitement to <laughs> um eagerness so i'm like as much as i want to say that s word but i'm going to say the e word i'm excited <laughs> <laughs> although I know, although I know it is going to be, and then, yes. then there's going to be people who's going to say like, Nick, are you sure what you're doing? Me. Yeah. Oh, my sweet mother-in-law who has watched <laughs> me support, my husband's a pastor, so he's a small church pastor. So she's watched me support him through years and years. She looked at me and she said, why would you quit your job <laughs> yeah. in the middle what? of a pandemic? And I'm like, I just have to, yeah, you know, and exactly. so, oh, I love that word. You just have to, because you're giving your, to. you're listening to yourself. Finally, yeah. I'm going to listen to me. Yeah. And I had a coach who coined the term tear excitified. So it's like terrified, excited, like mashed together. So she calls it tear excitified. <laughs> And I said, that's a perfect word because you're, you're, did you hear what I'm saying? Do you understand no, the word? No, 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 no. Because okay. it, it, it broke out just oh, now. Okay. It broke up. Yeah. Say it again. So it's terexcitified. So it's terrified and excited <laughs> mashed up together. Terexcitified. Okay. Terexcitified. And um, the other thing is, and this is what your instructor is probably sharing with you. Your teacher is probably sharing with you is that our nervous system doesn't know the difference between a fear yes. that's good and bad. So getting to the top of a roller coaster fear is the same kind of fear we might have when we think somebody's coming in our house. And, yes. and it's, it's in our bodies, it's the same feeling, but our brain has associated a positive thing and excitement with getting to the top of a roller coaster and about to go down, if that's something that you like. If you don't, find another example. <laughs> um, but It, our body and our minds have associated a really scary thing with someone potentially coming in our house, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it, our bodies don't know the difference. So when you tell yourself, oh, this is excitement, mm -hmm. I'm going to use the adrenaline. Brendan Burchard talks about this. I'm going to use the adrenaline for, ex for excitement because my body's producing adrenaline. I might as well use it positively. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I might as well just direct right. that to the, yeah, to, yeah. The, to the, the one that I'm going to create, which is, you know, All the clients that I want, I start imagining mm -hmm. the feeling, sitting in that feeling, clients coming up to me and say, okay, I want to work with you. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Absolutely. <laughs> wow. I actually asked two questions today. And we <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's, I'm a talker. No, no, I lo no, 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 no. I love that. It's because no, the questions are for guidance only, but I love, I love this, how, how we're flowing with this. So what is intentional optimism, Andrea? So intentional I, I optimism. Guess, I guess yeah, that the, 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 the thing that I just mentioned just now, like trying to 
picture or imagine, getting that feeling, the emotion of what you're trying to create, that is somehow falls along the line of intentional optimism. I don't know. Th- this is me thinking out loud. I love first thinking out loud. <laughs> I love thinking out loud. You know what it oh, does yeah. for us? My mother used to do that, but she used to say, I'm just talking out loud. <laughs> no, you're thinking out loud. Um, <laughs> Your mommy's so cute. <laughs> yeah, she was a lot of fun. We lost her in 2017, which oh, is really I'm so kind sorry. of. Well, mm. thank you. We lost her to breast cancer. But um, it was, and she fought till the end. And she was my inspiration to make some changes, right? Not mm. just in my body, but also in how I live my life. And so that's kind of where intentional optimism came from. She was like a bottle of champagne. You pop the cork and it's like, there's Judy, you know? And she was very bubbly and sanguine. Yeah. Um, and I wanted, I am a more realistic, anxious person. And <laughs> I say that realistic, realistic and anxious. But you embody that. You're so vibrant. Like I can, I can feel it from thousands <laughs> well, of miles across the world. Good. I love it. I'm, I'm hopeful it. that that's what comes across because I can do that, but I want to make sure it's real, right? I want to make sure it's not just a mask I'm putting on. So when, she, when I lost her, I decided, you know what? I'm 50. I have an eight-year-old adopted son. And I'm my husband and I'm, I need to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And I need to make sure that I am really proud of it and that I can, I'm not wasting anything. What do I want to stand for? And so I did another brain dump, similar to my core values, did another brain dump and said, what do I want to stand for? So these are more like principles. These are attitudes and mindsets. And what I did was I narrowed it down to six, what I call tenets. Tenets are things that in different religions, they might use a tenet uh, language. In Christianity, we don't usually use that. But um, tenets are like principles and um, priorities. So I have six of them and they kind of Optimistic is the first and intentional is this. They kind of bookend each other, but um, literally it is the attitudes and mindsets that we employ and embody to live out both our core values and our goals and dreams with excellence. It's mm. how, like you read it's in the, the bio, how, right. it's how I want to do what I do. So I start with who are you, your core values? How do you communicate that, your disc? And then we talk about how are we going to live that out? Ooh, and that. you don't have to live all of intentional optimism yourself. I mean, you may not need to be, you may be a naturally optimistic person, so you don't need to focus on that. But optimistic is not sunny optimism. It's hopeful. It understands it's confident of things and it's proactive. So it's very, it's an active and action oriented optimism. It's like, I know I have enough to make the next best step and I'm going to move forward. And I know something better is down the road. I have to go get it. Right. It's like, so it's optimistic in that view. The second one is being present. And it's more than just being in the moment. It has to do with wonder, seeing the beauty in things, being generous with my time and my money. As a I love 40, that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, a 42 yes. year old, brand new mom, all of a sudden, I needed to be. <laughs> Very, it's like this demanding child, right? Um, and yes. so now that he's a teenager, he's a 15 year old and he loves memes and he loves humorous things. And it's just so easy for me to say, no, I don't want to see another one. No, I don't want to see another one. And because our sense of humor is not the same, right? Oh. And no. And part of that's because I'm a 57 year old woman and he's a 15 year old boy, right? But part of that is we just have very different personalities, but mm-hmm. learning to be generous with my time and just saying yes, just for a moment, just say yes. Yeah. Right? And what he is just that? Gets, like, yeah. It, yeah. He just gets so much joy out of that. So that's being present with him, right? It's like, he doesn't need me to get in his face and say, how are you? He's like, that's weird. Mm-hmm. But what he wants is for me to enjoy a laughter with him, you know, some mm-hmm. laughter, um, but being kind and open. Like I said, making sure that other people feel like they belong. The third one is energetic. I'm 57. I need to make sure I have enough energy to make it. Um, but also as you're moving into this entrepreneurial space, it's this attitude of industry. It's thinking outside the box, always looking for the next thing. What's my next step? How am I going to grow this? What's How is this going to help people? Mm-hmm. And then being allowed to tap into the excitement that's out there. What is it that is exciting and brings me joy? Because when you are life focused and you're more focused on joy, then you're more likely to share that with other people. And you said, you're glowing, you're bubbling. It's like, this is my life focus, right? This is me being yeah. focused on excitement and saying, I'm going to live this out. Now, I need a break in between interviews because I expend a lot of energy on an interview, but I just mm-hmm. know myself, but I want to make sure that I have that available to give. 
So that's mm-hmm. the first three. The fourth one is courageous, which is, that's where leadership comes in, right? It's like, I need to be willing to be the one to go first. Somebody's got to go first. Sometimes it's me, sometimes it's not in whatever situation. And I always lead myself first and then I lead others. But mm-hmm. I, it also means a, a sense of adventure. Like what's around the next corner? Like, I don't know what's around the Nobody next corner. Nobody has so. done it. Let me do it first. Yeah. <laughs> or I don't know what's around the next corner until I get there. So let me get there. You know. Yeah. And that builds up resilience, right? I, I like to say resilience is earned from the falling down and the getting back up and the falling down and the getting back up. We build yes. the muscle of resilience. The fourth one is probably the hardest one for me to own. I don't think it's hard for me to do, but it's hard for me to own because I was taught that wise or being, you know, having wisdom was something that old people did mm-hmm. <laughs> or smart people. Right. And we never think of ourselves like we don't think of ourselves as worthy, like wise and smart. Mm-hmm. And I'm really working to embody that. And I want to make sure that every time I show up, anybody that's talking to me gets whatever wisdom I have. It's free. I give it. I don't, I don't hold it back, but it means that I'm willing to understand you and where you come from before I make sure that you understand me, right? I want to, I want to be wise in that. I want my words to be uplifting. I want to be respectful, all those things. So that's an attitude that I want to live out. And then wrapping it all up with intentional. I have a purpose. When I was working in the hospitals or school of medicine, I'd be walking down the hall and people were like, I can tell you're coming. (laughs) It's like clomp, clomp, clomp. And I'm like, I'm I don't wander, right? I'm not a wanderer. I'm going somewhere. I always I have a purpose for what I'm doing, to make plans, and I'm I'm interested in growing. And so, you know, John Maxwell says, if you uh, don't evaluate your experience, you won't grow. If you if you plan not to grow, or if you don't plan to grow, you will not grow. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. cool, and then we get out of that structure of learning, and we forget. So that's the intentional piece. And so, you know, a lot of times I'll work with a client and they'll like, they'll work on one. For me, this was like a survival guide. I needed this. Mm -hmm. And to be able to say, all right, as I head towards my next, hopefully 50 years, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to live. So I love that people are interested in it. I love that other people, you know, want to learn what it is because for me, it was life-giving. And I love when you said intention, because to me, I also believe, I always tell this to my teammates back when I was still working, I said to them, everything that you do, you must start it with intention. What is your intention on completing certain things? And and then now that you have you have that intention and you're moving forward with the with your courage, with your own conviction, okay, I'm heading this di- towards this direction. And it's, and you have to also understand that not um there will be people who will not be on the same bandwagon as as you are and you mu- and you and it's okay mm-hmm. you know it's okay mm-hmm. and i think it's the it's transition between believing in yourself and also not judging that other people cannot see the vision that you have for whatever mm-hmm. it is that you're doing Mm-hmm. I guess that's that's the the acceptance part and just moving on your path graciously with that. Yeah. And yeah, mm. that is my the things that I always remind myself. And that's about yeah, it's I think it yeah, judge judgment, mm-hmm. be judgmental. I think that's that's a yeah. that's a key thing that I have to keep myself, you know, check myself out so that I don't fall into that oh okay they don't see this and yeah mm-hmm. and you know we have well, I call them my ABCs we have assumptions beliefs and conditioning we mm-hmm. assume certain things based on and we have beliefs that we've been we've chosen or we've been trained in and they're always changeable and we forget that but then all the conditioning below the surface like an iceberg is stuff that we were kind of like the environment we were raised in the people that we listen to the people that are kind of in us and we don't realize how all of that affects all of our own assumptions and our beliefs and when we are conditioned to think things like you know i'm i'm supposed to be able to have a vision and people are going to listen to it and like usually it's the opposite it's like nobody's going to listen to this right mm-hmm, it's like they're never mm-hmm. going to do it and because we've been conditioned to think that we're not important or we're not we don't have something worthy of sharing <laughs> we're condition, yeah we're not yeah. enough but no yeah. we are <laughs> yep absolutely thank you i love i love doing i love doing what i do 
talking to people. Yay, good. <laughs> wow. Okay. Mindful of the time. Andrea, what is deconstruction and is it necessary for me? To me, I'm a natural critical thinker, right? I said I am autonomy of thought. It's like if you if something comes in, I'm gonna like pick it apart. And then say, how does it then You're going to have two, three steps uh, ahead of it, like, figured out what, what's it, the yes, outcome going to be natural. like. Yeah, it's very natural mm-hmm. for me. But there were a lot of that conditioning that I was raised with. Like I said, I'm a Christian. I was raised, I'm a missionary kid. I was raised with certain things. There's conditioning and beliefs that many of them I still have. But a lot of times we grow up with things and we don't realize the things that we have just accepted, right? They're just, it's like a fish swimming in water doesn't know it's wet, right? I mean, it's just things that we've never examined, right? (laughs) Yeah. And an unexamined life to me is a wasted life, right? An unexamined Mm, or an unexamined (sighs) belief system is wasted, right? If Mm. you cannot tell me why you believe what you believe in a way that's not defensive, then you have work to do. And that mm-hmm, could be mm-hmm. in religion, that could be yes. in justice, Political, it could be in yeah, politics yeah. or race, Views, it yeah. economics, it could be mm-hmm. anywhere. Um, but if you can't tell me why you believe what you believe, you have work to do. I have so much work to do. <laughs> but I tell you, Same. it yeah. started, for me, it started in that religion area and realizing I had a lot of scaffolding built up and all these things built up. And the reality is I didn't need any of that. I just needed the basics. You know, yeah, like, you just needed oh, that with that one, getting rid of tenets, all of that. right? Like, yeah, well, the foundation, yeah. Yeah. the foundation, what I would call mm-hmm. maybe the closed hand mm-hmm. stuff for me. I need my Bible, I need good fellowship, I need those kinds of things. I don't, I don't have to have, and my husband's a pastor, right? So it's like I haven't jettisoned any of this, but I don't have to have all of the things that American church says I have to have. I just, I don't, <laughs> you know, because Jesus didn't say that. And, but, that was a big piece for me. But once I started that, then I realized, then I was like, but then there's the politics and then there's the demographics and then there's the race and then there's the justice and then there's the, the industry and, and then there's the industry and there's, ah! and it's easy to get overwhelmed. Yes. But if you're willing to be intentional and to grow and to examine yeah. and to be a critical and be thinker, kind when, while you're uncovering all of this. To me. Yes. Yes. There were days I was on the floor weeping because of things I knew I had said, attitudes and, and, and statements I had made or things that I had espoused. You know, it's like I had said, you know, I'd been in this like specific political genre. And so I had like said certain things from there. And I look at that and I think, oh, how much <laughs> damage did I do? Right. Uh-huh. I mean, uh-huh. and, but it's, it's that giving yourself the grace to, Know what you know, when you know it and say, yeah. all right, I am going to, I am always in this constant state of deconstruction mm-hmm. and, you know, that, yeah. and really it's a scary word sometimes. And it can be really scary because sometimes you're taking I, down. I think it's synonym to right. awareness, right? Somehow a synonym to being aware. Yeah. But you have to be willing to do something with the awareness. Uh, yes. Yes. You know? I mean, it's more Putting than it into that. action. Yeah. 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 It's more, if you're I mean, aware, but you're not doing anything, then it's a just the same. I loved my grandmother very much, but towards the Mm -hmm. end of her life, she made a statement to me. She said, I've realized, meaning I'm aware that I'm a little bit of a racist and I'm okay with that. And I'm like, (laughs) that did not sit in my stomach, but I'm not um, okay with that, you know, thank you for the information. (laughs) And that's the difference, right? There's an awareness. There's not a willingness to do something about it. That's true. That's true. You know, at, 75, 80, 85 years old, it's a lot more difficult to break down the things that you've believed all your life or been taught or kind of just didn't realize were there. And so um, I think it's just, it's hard work, but it's worth it. And, you know, to be a critical thinker, and we're not taught to be critical thinkers. We're taught to recite things. We're taught to memorize things, all of our school systems. I don't know what they're like in Malaysia, but here in the United States, same. Okay. So it's all like, Everything is you recite back what it is. I mean, we, we struggle with my son. And you, <laughs> you know, it's just like, just answer the question, you know, or just do it fast enough or just turn your work in. You know, it's like once you get and, out of high school, if you don't go to college, that's fine. But, you know, it's like you just need to pass. <laughs> yeah. And that's re- reciting that that very act of reciting that creates your belief. Sometimes right. you just recite like when you're small, you just reciting, it's very, very, but then you associate that with that being true. True. 
Yes. Ding ding. High five. High five. <laughs> yeah, you do. You associate all those things with being the truth. Yeah. And you don't realize that the textbooks were written by people here in the United States <laughs> that had a specific <laughs> bent who were trying to tell a different story to make it exactly. look better. Exactly. And you don't exactly. realize that I'm a Southern Baptist. I mean, I, you don't realize that or I struggled with it for a really long time, but the Southern Baptists slid off from the regular Baptists in 1845 mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they wanted to send slave owners. As, Sway. You know, yeah. and it's just like, how does that not bother you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, like how is this? So I have to be really careful because we're still in the Southern yeah. Baptist convention, but in my church, that is not taught. Right. It's like, mm. it's, it's, we live differently, you know, and we live, um, a different way. So until, you know, as I would say, God in pro his providence moves us out of being in a church, I get the opportunity to teach people differently. I get the opportunity. To say, this is not what Jesus would have done. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's, but I also I want to be kind and gracious them with, with anybody that I talk so with that they can think because of themselves. they like, have okay. had the and beliefs they can start just like I did. It. Right. So yeah. it's very important to remember that the work is long, the work is hard, and it's not just for me, mm -hmm. right? It, it's if somebody else is in a hard spot and they're reacting to something, it's because something is either hitting a core value or an assumption or a belief that they have, and I need to be and gracious have, and yeah. give them the space to figure to it out. To work on it. Yeah. On it. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. And as, as you, you were breaking up just now, but I was just saying that you provide them with the tools and then for them to think for themselves and make the change in the different respective aspect of their life. So let's say they're coming yeah. to you for career, coming to you for I don't know life, and mm -hmm. then they can sort of use that on other things and how it's integrated yeah. holistically. Yes, and that's, that's the word that I use for core values. I say, now go integrate them. Integrate mm. them into your leadership, your life, your yeah. family, and then see what happens with everything else. It's like, it's like tossing a, a stone into a pond. There are ripples. It's, it's there gonna falls. It. and it has to start with you. Mm -hmm. Oof. I love that. Thank you, Andrea. You're welcome. <laughs> so what is next for you? Um, I am, I'm enjoying being more involved locally and I have a leadership conference coming up in October that I'm doing here in the Charlottesville, Virginia area. Um, I may in the future try to put that a little bit online. We'll see. But um, I also uh, am, I have my core values course and then I have um, some hybrid coaching that I'm doing. Like you have the course plus some coaching. Um, I don't know how soon this will be published, but I'm still looking for about 15 more alpha testers. I call it. It's like you get the core values course and four coaching calls with that to help you work through that. Because I'm thinking about potentially putting together, <laughs> you hear that? I'm like hedging my bets. Maybe a group coaching program. I don't know if it's going to be good for a group or if it's going to be good for individual. But I'm also working uh, this weekend. I've been working with some ladies. I do, I do free mastermind groups where you can come in and learn some stuff and work through a book with me. Um, and I'm happy to share that kind of stuff with you. As long as people can get on a Zoom call, they can participate. Um, but I'm, they've asked me as a way to continue that, to start a little bit of a membership program where we'll meet maybe once or twice a month and do leadership work and, and talk about that kind of thing. So I'm excited to see where this will go. I do have some, some contracts I'm waiting on. I love working in big teams, but I'm very, very excited about the way people are reacting to my core values work because it is at. This is, I told my husband, I said, this is sustainable for me. This is my soul work, right? This is the kind of stuff that oh, just- Oh, I love that. This is, you know, this is my calling. <laughs> yeah, this is my calling to help people see what it is and to help them understand who they are. And therefore, no matter where they go, how they can decide whether or not they want to fit in or align with whatever they're doing. Mm, mm, mm. So, Andrea, you mentioned where can people- get in contact with you. My website is the intentional optimist, like intentional optimism, the intentional .com. Mm -hmm. You can find me on Instagram, same handle, LinkedIn, same handle, Facebook. I'm not, I'm on there, but I'm not super active. I also have a, a podcast called stand tall and own it. And it's just, it's my own stuff. And we're heading into almost 200 episodes. So Amazing. yeah, so early on <laughs> is some like explanation of intentional optimism. But I told my podcast producer, I said, everybody's asking about intentional optimism again. I think we're going to have to revisit that. But if you DM me on Instagram or LinkedIn, I'll always respond. And I would love to hear from you. I would, again, welcome, just contact me if you're interested in the core value stuff. There's a button right above my head on my website. 
that says free core values exercise. And it's a download to get you started. If it's not enough, then you can contact me for the digital course or coaching. Mm, mm, mm. Beautiful. <laughs> so many good things coming up for you. I love it. I'm going to, you're going to be one of my um, people that I'm going to look up to when I'm designing certain things. And I'm like, oh, Aww. I love your Instagram. No, it's really, really. I love your Instagram and I have it open because I'm like, oh, I'm going to revisit this. <laughs> and right what? now, I'm not really putting much on there. I'm Because what I'm doing is, I, here's another piece. It's like, I help mm -hmm. people understand their strengths and work in their strengths, right? So for DISC, it's like, we don't work on, yeah, we need to like figure out certain things, but my strength is talking like this ah, and so i don't advertise connecting connecting yeah, <laughs> i love like, it I don't, I don't do i don't have a big social media plan right so mm -hmm. what you see on there is i'm my goal is to get on 200 plus podcast episodes interviews this year and so what you see on there is i'm sharing other people's podcast episodes and everybody's like oh this is really cool and i'm like thank goodness because that was the easiest <laughs> social media for me ever <laughs> but it's just figuring out what works for me right yes so, exactly i mean when oh. i can pay somebody to have a big social media like campaign and for them to uh -huh, do it uh -huh, and make uh -huh. it, go for it go so ahead yeah tons of content it's just i'm better at doing this and so <laughs> I love that. Myself, right? Yes. Yes. Andrea, what is your heart's greatest wish? That I could truly just, I think I could do this for the rest of my life, right? That I could, mm -hmm. that I could help other people understand who they are at their core so that they could be fulfilled and that they could flourish. I just want to see humans flourish. And so, you know, it's especially women, but all humans, you know, I have a son, so I have to start not only focusing on women, but, um, because men need it too, you know, everybody's yes, damaged yes. by patriarchy, not just women. And so, so I, true. Yeah. I just, I, my heart's desire is for everybody to understand what their core mm. values are so that they can flourish. Mm. Do you have a mantra that you live by? Mm. Do I have a mantra? You know, I think I used to, um, I, I guess now it's, it's almost like, don't tell me what to think. That says it all. You don't have to. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> you don't have to I'm tell me what to think. I'm going to own my mantra. Don't tell me what to think. I and love so, that. Um, I hadn't really thought about it because I used to have stuff like that. It's like, you know, live well, be well, whatever. I, but it, no, it's like the reality is if I'm getting back to who I am, that's probably what it is. It sounds very defiant. <laughs> mm, no, no. <laughs> I am rooting for you because my mantra would be be yourself authentic yep. that's my number yeah. one <laughs> <Actually>. yeah <laughs> yeah and, and you're worth it yeah yes yes, yes. and you're enough yeah is there anything that keeps you up at night or do you sleep well i'm gonna be honest money keeps me up at night sometimes you know it's like finances that that <laughs> especially now especially now moving to entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial I've been doing space two and a half years you know and it's like i'm supposed to be making a million dollars by now you know but you know sometimes money does and because you know we're human and we're normal and so i we're doing a lot of work on my money mindset and helping me understand what does abundance mean it just so you know that helps me sleep better knowing that abundance mm. doesn't mean having a million dollars abundance means having what i need today right Ooh, it's like wow i love that having yeah. what I need today and that's it take yeah. it one step one day at a time one if step I have at a time more, if i have more today than i need i'm i'm in abundance yeah. right and it's like well that's a whole new way to look at it cool i'm good so yeah i'm getting that money i so, love that yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Andrea, you you unlock something within me. Thank you. I'm gonna well, use that. I'm just gonna give that to Megan Hale. She is a, a money mindset coach, um, mm -hmm. and her Instagram is amazing too. And she works with entrepreneurs as well. So, uh, yeah, it's Megan Hale. Okay, Megan <laughs> Hale Co. <laughs> okay, I'll check it out. So, <clears throat> last question. I think you're gonna say the same thing, but let me just read out the question for you. If you could create a quote right now for you to leave to the audience listening and the world as your legacy, what would it be? And now I'm going to change it different. I'm going to say, because this is really more, it's like, think for yourself. Think mm -hmm. for yourself because nobody, you will live, let me put it this way. Everybody in the world will be happy for you to live exactly as they tell you to. Ooh, right? ooh, ooh. But don't do it. Yes. Just don't do it. Think for yourself. And it may be that you still agree with all of that. It may be that you stay in that same organization or culture or job or demographic or whatever. But as long as you're willing to do it for yourself, think for yourself. You know, it doesn't mean we don't ask for help, but think for yourself because your brain 
is way more powerful than you will ever give it credit for. And you have more discernment than you realize. You have more wisdom than you realize. You have more courage. All those tenets of intentional optimism, you have more than you realize. So think for yourself. Thank you. I think that wraps up our interview today. That was beautifully said and beautifully wrapped. Wow. Thank you so much, Andrea. You, you gave me something to think about before I go to bed tonight. Good. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wake up with that notion of intentional optimism i'm gonna look up Good. look those up in your website thank you yeah. so much and i have a do i have a free download if you just google what is intentional optimism it should come up if right. not email me and i will send it to you okay i will <laughs> perfect well andrea thank you again for your time i wish you all the best in your endeavors and in your long filled beautiful life ahead Thank you. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. You have a great day. Let no, us. <laughs> Thank you. Let's stay in touch. Okay. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay.